cells are lost in the central part of your vision, like for age-related macular degeneration, your field of view can go from this to this rather quickly. One possible way to fix this is to replace the cells that are lost by generating new cells in the lab in cell replacement therapy. Of course, this requires a detailed knowledge of how the eye forms. Humans and animals, even though we've evolved different body shapes and sizes, it's remarkable. The eye actually forms very similarly. So the same cell types and the same structure is found in species as diverse as frog to human. So today I'm going to tell you a story about how we use proteins in, uh, in the frog, or we discovered the proteins in the frog that drive eye formation, and how subsequent discoveries have led to clinical trials for healing age-related macular degeneration. So I brought a movie here to show you how the eye, form, how the eye functions. And basically, light is uh, driven to the back of your eye to a tissue called the retina. And the retina has those three layers. And the cells um, absorb the light. Uh, the, there's a pigmented uh, retinal epithelial cells in the back. And they focus the light on the photoreceptors. And the photoreceptors are the ones that transform the light signal into an electrical signal that's then passed to the brain. And the brain detects this as light. So even though the retina is using light to function, too much light um, causes the retina to degenerate or, or to die. Once the cells have degenerated, the retina can't make new ones in order to repair them. When I set out to determine what proteins drive retinal cell formation, I realized that the human eye is too complex, and there's too many questions that are left unanswered. Plus, the cells were developing in utero, so it's really difficult to study human eye development. I searched for a model organism that was easy to manipulate, but similar enough to the human eye that what I found could then be taken back to the human system. And I looked in the literature, and I found stem cells. Because and stem cells give rise to all cells of the body, so that would be a great way to study retinal cell formation. Uh, so what was the first animal that was cloned using stem cells? Anybody know? I heard, I heard Dolly the sheep. That's right, that's what everybody says is Dolly the sheep, and that's a common misconception. Actually, the first animal clone was uh, the frogs, Oedipus laevis. And this work was done by Sir John Gurdon back in the late 50s, and he just recently won the Nobel Prize for this work in 2012. So Xenopus has been used by developmental biologists for over 100 years uh, because they're really great to study how organs develop. So I brought a movie here to show you how quickly they develop. This is one of the advantages of using the Xenopus system. And I put the uh, head and the tail to orient you which way this, this uh, embryo is forming. And the upper left-hand corner, I've put the developmental stages that are necessary in forming an eye. So these animals are, um, are, are growing very quickly. This, this movie actually loops through in about 24 seconds and cover, covers about 24 hours of uh, development in Xenopus. And from the time of fertilization to a fully functional mature eye takes about three and a half days. That's very quick. So compare that to the mouse, which takes about over 40 days to develop from fertilization to a mature eye, and humans, which take over a year. Also, Xenopus can lay thousands of, of these eggs in one day, and they develop in a simple salt solution on your bench top. You can actually watch them, and so they're accessible to genetic and physical manipulation. And the retina of these animals are actually very, very simple. They t contain about 25,000 cells. Compare that to a human retina, which contains about 160 million cells. Despite these differences, these cell types and genes involved in generating the eyes of more complex vertebrates are also found in the frog eye. Therefore, using the frog is a great way to figure out the proteins that are involved in eye development. So what do we know about uh, retina formation so far? So embryonic stem cells, like I said, give rise to all cells of the body. And they give rise to the three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And I'm showing you the, mes the ectoderm here because that's what gives rise to the nervous system and the skin. There are outside factors that neuralize uh, the ectoderm, and those are called neural inducers. And they work outside the cell, and they turn on genes inside those cells called transcription factors. And transcription factors are really cool. 
because they, they go into the nucleus and they bind to the DNA and transcribe the DNA into RNA. And um, that RNA is then unique to that tissue type. Wherever those transcription factors are um, expressed, that's, that's what kind of tissue you're gonna make. So we set out to find the transcription factors that were involved in eye formation. And right away, we noticed something really cool that was happening. And that there were seven transcription factors that were uh, evolutionary conserved between fish, frog, and mouse. And they were expressed right when the eye was first forming in this area called the eye field. So we call these transcription factors eye field transcription factors, or EFTFs. Now, if these transcription factors are all that's necessary to making a retina, we should be able to just take pluripotent cells, add these transcription factors, and generate a new eye. So we tried that. What we did was we made the RNA for the EFTFs. We also used a tracer RNA, um, uh, yellow fluorescent protein, so that we would watch where the RNA spread throughout the embryo. So we injected the RNA into the two-cell stage embryo and then allowed the embryo to grow. It spread the RNA through the embryo, and then we removed the stem cells, and we allowed them to heal. And then we simply just replaced the normal host eye uh, with these cells and then asked whether or not they formed a new eye. And they did. So in our controls, you can see that the, the YFP expressing tissue on its own doesn't form any eye. There's an eye missing on that side because it's been removed to re replace it with the transplanted cells. But now the EFTF expressing tissue is forming a beautifully new, beautiful new eye. You can even see the axons coming out of the eye and synapsing onto the brain. The eye grows with the tadpole. So as it goes through metamorphosis, it's still there. And if you section through the tadpole's retina, you can see that every cell is from the transplant. All right. So uh, we decided to uh, publish our work. We were really excited about this. We found the transcription factors that were involved in eye formation. And uh, the reviewers came back and so told us that what we really need to do is figure out whether or not this eye was functional. So uh, we went back to the literature and we found the behavior assay that was standard in the field. And what it required was for us to put a visual cue in front of the Xenopus and then watch its tail flip in response to the visual cue. The problem was that our tadpoles, because it had undergone the surgical procedure, had kinked tails. So it was really difficult to watch that tail flip. We tried for about a year, and we worked, for, we worked with the bioengineering department at Syracuse University to try to figure out some sort of system where we could spray water on the tadpole and just watch that tail flip. And nothing was working. Um, so I was frustrated, and I went back to the literature, and I searched through decades of work on Xenopus biology, trying to find some, some other behavioral assay that was, that was a little easier to work with. And I came up with this one. And it's a very simple system. You'll see that the tadpole likes swimming on the, on the light side. So when it's presented with a black and white tank, it's naturally drawn to the light side of the tank, not the dark side. Yeah, this led to many bad Darth Vader jokes in the lab. <laughs> but it also allowed us to ask whether the tadpole was using the transplanted eye to see. So what we did was just snip the connection between the eye and the brain in the wild type eye and then just measure the amount of time that the tadpole is swimming on the white side of the tank. Then we went in and did the control experiment where we snipped the transplanted eye, and now the, the, fish is, the tadpole is swimming around the tank randomly. So this suggests that it's using its transplanted eye to see. So now we could generate a model for how retina formation occurs. So simply adding these seven transcription factors were, were all that was necessary that was sufficient for generating these retinal cells. Now think about this. There's over 30,000 genes that are expressed in a tadpole, and you only need seven to form this beautiful neural network, right? Isn't that impressive? Yeah, we thought so too, and so we told our stem cell biologists, like, okay, look at this cool work that we just published. And they were like, well, that's great. So uh, you need seven, right? Um, could you possibly bring that down? Because that's a lot to inject into a cell. <laughs> so I, I looked into it, and if you do every permutation of those seven, you'd have to have 5,000 different groups of these transcription factors 
in order to <laughs> test them for eye formation. Yeah, that's not going to work. So what we did instead was we started looking at each of the different eye field transcription factors and figuring out their role in eye formation. And we focused on the one that was at the top of the cascade, the TBX3 molecule. And we found out, and this is work done in collaboration with uh, my husband, Mike Zuber, and a talented graduate student in the lab, Zara Motahari, who figured out that all we really need is TBX3 and PAC6. So others have found that, um, have looked into those neural inducers that I talked about at the very beginning, to find out which ones were activating these transcription factors. And uh, so there's several groups that have done this work, and we've all uh, converged on this one protein called Noggin, and there's others as well. And um, the frog is a wonderful system to figure out these genetic networks. However, since they've evolved over millions of years, it would be best to test our discoveries using a mammalian system. And so other labs have also taken this work and used these neural inducers to uh, generate retinal tissue using mouse embryonic stem cells. So these images use uh, mouse cells using, um, from a lab in uh, Japan. And uh, incidentally, the researcher that did this work was trained as a Xenopus biologist. That's how he's so good. Uh, he also used factors that he discovered while working in the frog lab. And the cells are glowing green because he genetically altered them so that they would be expressing gene, uh, green fluorescent protein under the control of a retina-specific promoter. So everywhere we were seeing green is where the retina is forming. And I don't know if you can appreciate this, but the cells are, are morphologically able to form an embryonic cup, just like you see in the mouse embryo, all on their own. And so these are called 3D retinal organoids for that very reason. People have also taken human pluripotent stem cells and used a similar sort of culturing assay and found that they could take uh, those cells and push them towards this retinal cell fate. Now, I want to emphasize that they not only make the retinal cells, but they also make this pigmented layer of cells that are found in the back of the eye, the retinal pigment epithelium, the RPE. And the reason why that's a really important cell type is because that's the cell type that's degenerating during age-related macular degeneration. So there have just recently been, in the last month and a half, two papers that have come out and shown that if you take these retinal pigment epithelial cells and the culturing system is there on the top, you grow them out into a sheet, into a layer, into a single layer, and then grow them also onto a solid support you can, what these uh, clinicians have done is to transplant it into, back into the uh, patients with age-related macular degeneration. And they actually grow and improve the vision in several patients. And they watch these patients over a year, and their ability to read letters and their speed of reading improved. With this breakthrough, there's hope uh, for those living with blinding diseases, but of course there's surgical complications and questions that remain unanswered that could improve this type of therapy. Questions about how to generate retinal cells specifically lost in other forms of blindness is currently underway, and many groups are using model organisms to understand how specific retinal cell types are formed. In this way, these cells can be used in cell replacement therapy just like the RPE. So my hope is that by hearing my words, you'll appreciate the power of using the frog to understand how organs like the eye form so that you can tell others that using model organisms is an important way to find new discoveries that could lead to curing human disease. The reason why this is very important is because the National Eye Institute has, in the last decade, decreased the funding for frog labs by over 30%. And so labs like mine struggle to, to stay afloat because if we are doing any work in Xenopus, it's much more challenging to get funding. The other thing that's really cool about the Xenopus system is that their eyes regenerate all on their own. So if you damage a tadpole eye, they can grow a new retinal tissue. Not like we can, we, we just can't do that. So it'd be great to figure out the mechanism that allows the frog to be able to regenerate its retina um, and, and understand how that works. So it's really important that you tell others how cool the frog system is so that we can get this going forward. And of course, these therapies provide the hope that someday soon, if any of us are afflicted with age-related macular degeneration 
or another form of blindness that causes us to wake up one day and see something like this, we'd be able to fix it so that we could see this again. Thank you.